Good morning and thank you for joining us for this webinar Wednesday session for February. Today we are looking at flood resistance and flood resilience. My name is Katie, I'm Digital Services Specialist here at CABE and uh, I'm here to help with any assistance you may need this morning throughout the session. To interact with us today, there is a, the option to send us questions um, by typing them in on the if you're on a desktop, I understand it's on the right-hand side, but if you're using a device such as an iPad, I've been told it's actually at the top of your screen, but somewhere on your screen, you will have an admin panel where you can actually type questions to us. And uh, if you send any questions over to us, what we'll do is answer as many as we can as we're going along throughout the session, and if not, we'll answer them at the end. If we've got quite a lot of common themes, we may pick them up throughout as we go. So your speaker this morning, your presenter is Kevin, who's Technical Director at CABE, and he's going to be talking you through the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Kevin, and um, thank you very much. Right, good morning. Um, I don't normally address questions quite this early in the uh, webinar, but there's a, a comment come in that says, has Kevin got lipstick on his cheek? No, it's just my naturally rosy disposition. Now, actually, there's a little red light on the end of the microphone, and that's what's reflecting. So, um, so apologies for my appearance, and even more apologies if you are actually looking at me, which I... I can only apologize for it this time of the morning. So today we're going to look at flood resistance and flood resilience. Um, it's a subject that's undertaken a lot of work recently, um, not least in a report published a few months ago now, uh, the Property Flood Resistance Action Plan, um, produced by DEFRA as a sort of a national strategy on what we can do regarding flooding and how to reduce the impact. Um, there's been a number of work streams looking at what can be included, particularly when um, putting buildings back into use following flood. And it's one of those subjects I think we'll see a lot more of over the coming months. Um, so to start with, uh, an interesting sort of statistic. Um, roughly one in six properties in the UK is at risk of flooding. Now, we tend to think of flooding as just being, you know, surcharge of rivers and watercourses, but obviously in a lot of uh, more urban situations where there isn't necessarily a river or a stream running through, it can just be surcharge of the drainage system in extreme weather conditions. Um, and it does tend to mean that across the whole property sector, not just domestic, there is a fairly high chance that somebody could be affected. And unfortunately, um, once somebody has been affected by flooding, when we put the property back into use, when we carry out those remediation measures, we actually find out that that property is still at risk again. And as a result, perhaps we need to be putting a little bit more thought into how we restore a property once it's suffered damage, as well as what we do in the initial design and construction of these properties. So, as we're looking at the properties, you do tend to find that we end up with a couple of terms, um, flood resistance and flood resilience. And a lot of properties are designed to be flood resilient or put back to be flood resilient. Uh, flood resistance is a little bit more, um, if you like, strategic in the design to stop the water actually getting into the property in the first place. So flood resistance are basically measures designed to keep the water out of a property. Now this could be something that's built in, it could be something that has to be applied when a warning of a flood um, is imminent, and it's basically about sealing all of those entry points, the windows, the doors, pipes and services entries, sealing up air bricks. Um, it is worth remembering with flood resistance, if we build the structure to keep the water out, if we end up with deep flood waters for a, a, a reasonable period of time, and when I say deep, I'm talking anything over sort of 600 millimeters, then the actual lateral load on the fabric of the building, the walls of the building, may be sufficient to cause structural damage in its own right. Um, now, obviously, if the water's gained entry, as it might do if we're not quite as resistant in terms of our construction, then you get an equalizing of the pressure across the wall, and it's not so much of an issue. But if that wall basically becomes a tanking structure holding back that volume of water, then it is taking that lateral load. And most of our external walls aren't necessarily designed to take lateral load, they're designed to take the vertical load down through the building. 
so if we're looking at something that's going to resist deep flood waters for potentially a period of time, then perhaps we have to look at beefing up the construction we're looking to put into the building. So what sort of things are we talking about when we're designing for flood resistance? Well, it's a package of measures. And um, it says there on the slide, flood barriers. That's not the sort of temporary flood barriers that have been strategically positioned around the country to hold the rivers back. This is barriers actually put on the envelope of the building. So it could be drop-in barriers that go in front of doors, uh, windows, but it could easily be that we also maybe put in flood-resistant doors and windows into the building, and they're becoming more and more commonplace now. But alongside that, you need a, an actual structure that's going to resist the moisture. So the brickwork, the pointing, the waterproofing, down to looking at what sort of insulation you've got, is that going to resist the moisture? Is it going to be a, you know, a, a, a basically a polystyrene type, bonded type polystyrene, which may well resist the moisture? Or is it going to be something that's more fibrous that will actually absorb and then take a considerable period to dry out? Um, you'll be looking at the membrane in the floor combined with, obviously, damp proof courses and, and tray arrangements to, to make sure that we have a, a continuous barrier, but also in looking at the floor construction, having to look at, again at the type of insulation, because putting a lightweight insulation that actually floats may cause damage to the floor, and again, under the water pressure. And then things like non-return valves in the drainage system, because quite, quite often it's the drains that surcharge that bring the water back into the property. And obviously the water will come out at the lowest connection. People tend to think of the, the WC pan overflowing, but the first instance will probably be things like the shower or the bath waste backing up. And obviously that brings with it the additional risk of the, the water actually being contaminated from the drainage system. And then, then things like air brick covers, which can be things that actually screw over air bricks once somebody's had a warning of a fire, or they can be automatic in nature and actually use the, the pressure of the water to seal the air brick up so that it's a sort of a, a one-way type air brick situation. So if we look at how some of these things might work in a little bit more detail, um, a flat barrier, this is the sort of thing where you see a framework on the outside of the building around the door and you sit, literally drop a barrier into that position um, during a flood scenario. Now quite often these barriers and baffles are not running the full height of the door, you've got to have room to drop them in, so they might be, I don't know, eight, nine hundred millimeters high, and again, one of the problems we have in looking at this sort of arrangement at the moment is actually to determine the anticipated level of flood. An awful lot of properties that were protected because they were anticipating a flood of four, five hundred millimetres, and we're finding with the more severe weather conditions, those flood waters are actually getting deeper and defeating some of those um, measures that we put in place. So the idea is that it drops in and creates a watertight seal around the opening. They can be automatic uh, um, and triggered by the water levels, or they more commonly are fixed manually. The difficulty with any of these measures that require um, manual operation or installation is that obviously it requires a decent warning of the flood, which we are getting better at doing, but it also needs somebody actually at the premises to be able to do that. And, and if the, the house owner or the business owner happens to be away for a few days, um, it might mean that the flood barrier isn't then put into place. Um, in a, in, as an option to those barriers, you can get flood-resistant doors and windows, um, which are just very tightly sealing in their frames. Obviously, the issue with those is we have to make sure that the frame itself is then sealed well to the surrounding structure. They tend to be slightly more costly because of the locking arrangement to make sure we've got that absolute seal, um, but they don't necessarily need an additional level of, of occupier input to make them work in the event of a flood. So what else might we be looking at? Well, we have to look at the whole design. Um, so we will have to look at things like weep holes. Um, so where we have weep holes, where we have um, services, looking at whether they can be sealed. Now the weep holes, uh, if they're needed for everyday use um, to fulfill their purpose so that uh, moisture and what have you can get out of the the structure. And obviously they, they tend to be the home for the spiders and what have you as well. Um, it might be that we just go in and put in little compressible seals, again, as and when we're warned about the potential for a flood. Um, so normally that will require some form of occupier action to stop the moisture getting in through those 
points. But obviously alongside that as well, there is a need for the occupier to understand that they have to maintain the external envelope for the building. And I think one of the difficulties we're, we're finding at the moment is that when somebody suffers a flood and then gets the property reinstated through a, an insurance claim in most cases, um, then what tends to be happening is people get it put back because they don't necessarily take the next step and take some sort of degree of ownership of putting it back to a better standard. And that perhaps is something that's a little bit odd. If you think of a, a parallel, if somebody's had a fire in a property and had to do some reinstatement work, then their level of awareness is usually such that they'll look to put something back that's more resistant in, in terms of fire than what was there originally. Um, whereas with flooding, people tend to just you know, allow the work to carry on to get back to that basic sort of a level. Um, so there is a need for people to understand their responsibility in this process, but also the importance of the maintenance of the structure. Um, if the envelope has been designed to resist the moisture, then we need to make sure that it's maintained in a way that's going to do that. Air bricks, I mean, a lot of, a lot of our properties need air bricks either for um, ventilating subfloor voids or providing combustion air. Obviously, we end up with air bricks that might well be the terminal of, of mechanical extract systems, but they tend to be at higher level. But simple things like um, ventilating ducts to um, tumble dryers and that sort of thing also need to have covers that we can effectively seal in the event of the fire. Now, normally what that requires is an extra little screw-on cover that seals the air brick, but again, it's an action required by the user of the property. And the, obviously, the downside of this is that somebody actually fixes the covers on and then leaves them on, and we lose that ventilation, which may well be critical as part of the process. As I say, you can get a sort of a non-return type air valve that as the water pressure rises, that will actually shut the air brick. But again, we're talking about something that's considerably more costly than the normal standard sort of an air brick. And then as part of the overall um, issue, there are the, 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 the question of putting in floor membranes, um, damp courses. Obviously, one of our major um, tools in trying to um, alleviate the issue with, with flooding is to raise that ground floor level. Um, and that may be the only option in certain areas where we're particularly on the floodplain. But obviously, we have to balance that with the requirement under the building regulations on new build, particularly, for accessibility. And somewhere, we have to make the judgment call as to what the right way is, is to do it. Now, a combination of the membrane that we put into the floor and the right type of insulation um, can help to resist the flood waters, but as with all of these things, the detailing of the joints and the linking is critical. Um, what might work well as a damp proof membrane in everyday use, once it's got higher water pressures pushing on the underside of it, may well end up um, needing a better degree of jointing and sealing to make sure we keep the moisture out. And with the floor, as with any other part of the construction, the type of insulation that we use is critical. Now, most floor insulation tends to be semi-rigid um, because we don't want the floor moving all over the place. Um, and as a result, they tend to be the types of insulation that don't necessarily become saturated. But if we've got an, an insulation that isn't in itself resistant to moisture, then putting the property back into use is going to require that insulation to be ripped out and replaced because it's going to take just far too long to dry out naturally. So we have to look at that sort of situation as well. And as I say, if the insulation is sat there with a membrane over it and then just something lightweight on top of that, the tendency is that the whole thing will tend to push up and cause structural problems as well. So, um, Non-return valves, as I said, drainage is one of the key ways in which um, we get moisture back into the property as, as they start to surcharge. So fitting a non-return valve um, so that the drainage won't necessarily back up into the property is one way of dealing with it. You can, as a property owner, um, get bungs and pan seals that will seal over the w or drop into a, a WC and inflate to seal that so that it doesn't back up. But as I say, you've also got to attend to all of your waste pipes and, and those sorts of bits and pieces. 
and sticking the plug into the waste pipe isn't necessarily going to do it, but you can get proprietary seals to go all of these things. Their effectiveness depends on the potential water pressure that we're talking about. And obviously, again, once you've got water coming back the other way, you've potentially got much higher pressures than you get in the pipework in everyday use. So again, there's the potential for those joints to leak where they wouldn't act normally um, in the way in which we use the drainage in the, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, oh, sorry, the slides are moving rather too quick um, and not quite in the way I want them to this morning. There we go. Um, but of course, the other issue to bear in mind is if you make your building totally flood resistant, in other words, you're building yourself um, something akin to a basement structure at ground floor level, then if the water does get into the property during a flood condition, uh, it can be far more difficult to get it out because basically what you've got is a contained structure. And whilst you may be able to put a pump in and remove the moisture, um, it will take much more because it won't naturally um, ebb away as the flood recedes. So that can lead to additional problems as well. So just a, a word of warning with that. Um, so that's, if you like, flood resistance. What is flood resilience then? Well, flood resilience is a feature of the property which resists the ill effects of flood water, um, but lets it dry out quickly without any permanent damage. So what we're actually doing here is we're recognizing that the flood water is going to get into the property. And what we're trying to do is actually then make sure that we can remove it fairly quickly afterwards that the damage that's been caused is minimized and that the cleanup and decontamination can be done relatively quickly. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was fortunate enough to go down to the building research establishment where they launched um, their new innovation park house, um, which is slightly remote from the actual innovation park. It's in an old Victorian terrace on the site, um, which has been designed to be flood resistant and flood resilient. And it's got a number of features there which allow for the building to be put back into use in a fairly short space of time following an event. So what we need to do is to um, look at what we can do in the design of the property to let the moisture in but get it back out again quite quickly. And again, we're looking at some fairly similar sorts of measures to the ones that we've seen for flood resistance, but practical things to help us get back into use. So things like building into the floor structure, drainage, and then sumps and pumps so that we can actually collect the moisture, pump it out from a, a, a sump point, and get back fairly quickly. Now, obviously, that can only be done post-flood because you can't just keep pumping it out into a drainage system that's already surcharged. But this can happen fairly quickly after the flood has actually receded. Within the property itself, looking at different than materials than perhaps we would traditionally use. So looking at resilient waterproof uh, wall finishes, something that is resistant to the water, but is also fairly easy to clean because one of the major problems with getting properties back into use is actually the decontamination because the water that's coming in isn't clean. Um, it says on the slide water resistant fittings, that's things like simple things like kitchen units that aren't simply fiber board with a, a melamine coating, they are actually water resistant to a degree that they will resist damage um, when the water gets into the property. Similarly with floor finishes, um, a lot of sort of ceramic tile type finishes in waterproof adhesives and, and, and grouting is a lot quicker to get back into use. And again, critically, the type of insulation that isn't going to absorb this uh, um, moisture. And then raising our service levels. Right, I'm just going to pick up on uh, one quick question that's come in. Um, it says, just a clarification, earlier in the presentation you suggested some flood resistant measures can have an adverse effect by holding flood water in a property following the flood. Is this so? I mean, yes, to a certain extent, if you've got a, a waterproof box, it will hold the water. Now, if your flood-resistant measures are things like 
a flood resistant door then obviously when you open the door you will be able to to get the water back out again but it is going to require a degree of pumping the water out it won't just recede in the same way that it came in so it's it sometimes can be more difficult to get the water out once it's already into the property where the, where you've got a totally flood resistant situation very much like if you flood a basement scenario because the basement is tanked it will then act as a basically a swimming pool and hold that moisture so it just takes a little bit more effort to get it out right back to the sort of flood resilience measures that we're looking at then um, and what what we're looking at in terms of practical things in a property what something like this um, this is very similar to what's actually in the BRE um, uh, property on the innovation part so the sort of space we're looking at where we've got uh, waterproof wallboard type um, fittings, flood resistant door and windows, the kitchen units are resistant to moisture with something like a ceramic or a, a granite worktop to them, um, the subfloor has a resilient insulation, uh, a membrane normally and, these are, and then something like ceramic tiles on top of that, non-return valves in the drains as we'd have seen with the, the flood resistant properties floor sumps leading to a pump and again actually we might put subfloor drainage around the perimeter to help to dry that out and move the water away and then you can do things like waterproof render externally you can spray apply insulation that will resist the moisture as well so there are a number of measures we can take to try and improve the performance of the property and how that works and then there's some practical bits and pieces just in terms of how we put the property together um, Traditionally, we put plasterboard in sheets straight up the wall. Um, so you get a standard sheet of plasterboard and put it up vertically. So we end up with joints at a fairly regular pattern. If we know that we're likely to be suffering from um, water ingress and, and flooding issues, then why not put the sheets in horizontally? Um, that way, as long as the flood water doesn't actually go higher than the bottom sheet, we only end up replacing the bottom row of plasterboard rather than having to replace full sheets all the way along. So we're admitting that we're going to have to do some replacement work, but actually we're trying to minimize the extent of it moving forward. Um, so again, it's not traditional thinking, but it's a fairly simple, quick fix to make sure that we don't have to replace quite as much as we would have done before. And I think with all of these things, there is a degree of, of you know, education with them. If we put in a lot of these water-resistant finishes, then we need to make sure that when we come back to putting property back into use, that we don't move in and do the normal sort of let's strip everything out and start again. We need to know that some of these things will actually be okay for your reuse and retained within the property. What else are we looking at then? Um, Right, floor finishes. Um, we can put down a fairly waterproof floor finish um, in terms of a tiled finish, whether it's a ceramic tile or something like an old um, plastic or something like that. We can return that up the wall as a skirting as well. Um, it might be more expensive in the, the first initial cost, but in terms of its um, resilience to a flood and getting back into use, again, can be relatively straightforward you do have to look at things like the jointing detail and how you've done that and the grouting because obviously when it comes to decontamination that can be quite um, fundamental but realistically it's another option and another way of trying to to make sure that we've got a degree of resilience within our property and then the, the, the simple things to think about and um, things like the services um, so we're used to new domestic properties having raised services in terms of accessibility probably what we're looking at here is raising those even higher still above where we anticipate the potential um, floodwaters may actually get to and certainly with with the, the ground floor services it would mean running the services at first floor level and dropping them down rather than running through the ground floor and raising them up to the sockets um, so that we've still got something that once we've got the water out we can get the service back up and running relatively quickly and obviously that needs to go to the, the next extreme um, the photo on the bottom of this slide shows some some air handling um, plants stuck on the external wall but it's quite common for smaller commercial premises for the external part of an air conditioning system to be sat more or less at ground level outside and obviously we need to think that that's maybe not the way to go and 
a, a lot of our um, uh, more low and zero carbon technology, things like heat pumps tend to sit at low level. So again, we need to think at how we can actually position these things so that they're more resilient, whether they're internal or external, so that we can actually try and make sure that we don't have too much of a problem. And then putting some, some pumps into the floor, um, actually putting floor drains in, putting in subfloor drainage underneath the screed that can then um, drain everything to a sump that enables us to be able to pump it out makes our life a lot easier and a lot quicker when we're actually trying to get the property back into use. Um, so if that can be done as part of our first recovery after our first flood, then next time it does make it far easier to actually get the property back into use and move it forward. We do, as I say, have to start looking at maybe some different types of materials. So um, insulation-wise, uh, insulation materials can be fairly waterproof in nature. And therefore, when we're reinstating after a flood or designing for a property in a, an area where we're likely to get a flood, then we need to look at those more uh, water-resistant insulations. If we've got a, 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 a construction that's got a fairly absorbent type insulation in it that relies on a fairly high air void ratio to give it that insulating characteristic, then obviously once that fibrous void becomes waterlogged, um, that's not easily going to dry out in the structure and quite often the only option will be to actually remove that insulation. Um, because purely because of the time it will take to actually dry out naturally. So in reality, specifying the right insulation in the first place, um, or if we do have to replace, replacing with something that's going to be more water resistant is a key feature in trying to move some of this stuff forward and run with it. And then, um, yes, something else that's going to cost us a little bit more, but you can get water resistant things like kitchen fittings. Again, one of the things that maybe would go alongside that would be to look at where the actual appliances go within the kitchen. So things like the washing machine, things like the dishwasher, the oven, the hob, looking at the heights of those, looking at potentially having them slightly raised to give us a bit more ability um, in a, a flood water situation to make sure that, that those things aren't particularly adversely affected and making sure that we don't have to rip out the whole kitchen if, if it does get a little bit wet is, is a big gain in terms of trying to get these properties back into use again. Um, what we have seen though recently is that the changing climatic conditions mean that we are getting a significant number of floods um, and it is worth bearing in mind um, as was, was said um, at the, the launch of the BRE house by representatives from DEFRA that it's never actually possible to construct a property be totally flood proof. Um, what we can do is the best that we possibly can and most of, most of the properties we're putting together will have a combination of flood resistance and flood resilient measures so that we can actually then try and move forward with some of this stuff in terms of speeding up recovery times. Now what, what is moving forward as part of the, the DEFRA Property Flood Resilience Action Plan, um, there's a, a body of work being done to look at training those who go in and act as surveyors post-flood situation in an understanding of what can be done um, to try and make sure that we're not doing more work than we absolutely need to but at the same time that we're getting properties that are a little bit more resilient going forward. And a lot of this work is being backed and supported by the insurance sector as well. Um, something else that's come out of the, the work that built the, the Flood Resilience Action Plan is a working group that's looking to see how we can change maybe standards and even a possibility that we look to build into things like building regulations, something in terms of resilience and moving it forward. So there's quite a lot of work there still to be done. Okay, now just picking up on a, another question that's just come in. Um, who's responsible to ensure the building is flood resilient or resistant? Um, planning put conditions regarding to flooding, but they never come to site to check compliance, and it's not part of building regulations. So not something that building control are checking. Now, ultimately, if, if, if it is a new build type situation, it will quite often be a planning condition, particularly if they're, they're building in an area that is floodplain, that some of these measures are put in. 
but it does come back down to um, the designer and the developer to ensure that the measures go in and are effective. Um, when we're looking at somebody then recovering from a flood later on, quite often again that doesn't have to go through any form of regulatory process. There is an argument that when you're um, reinstating wall finishes, if you're above the 50% trigger in terms of re uh, renovating a thermal element, perhaps building control get involved in that element of the work. But again, they're not necessarily looking at, at whether it's being put in a more resilient manner. Now, insurance companies are aware that there's an issue here with, with trying to get properties back into use. Um, and obviously, the normal sort of uh, insurance approach of, of we'll, we'll reinstate, but we don't really want to pay extra for anything better than was there before. Um, we are moving away from that in talking with the insurance sector about these issues to try and get a sensible sort of approach. But we have to bear in mind that any one particular insurer is always going to be nervous about paying for additional measures to improve the property for next time. Um, because the, the property owner may choose to go and reinsure with a, a different provider and therefore somebody else gains the benefit of those works. Um, so this is where really in the existing building market in reinstating after a flood, the property owner has to have a greater level of knowledge and understanding of their responsibility. But you're absolutely right in terms of who checks the measures when the building's put up in the first place. It quite often is a planning condition and if there's no regime to double check that on site, they are going to be taking somebody's word for the fact that that work has been done. As I said, that in the Flood Resilience Action Plan, it does mention that potentially there's scope to look at building regulations in terms of flood resilience, but that would need a fairly major sea change in terms of the regulatory approach because building regulations are fundamentally about the health and safety of people in and about buildings and not actually about the, the protection of the building itself. So it would need a, a particular sea change, if you like, in terms of the scope of the regulations. Okay, um, so that's a, a brief introduction to a subject that I think will be recurring over and over over the next uh, couple of years as we try and make sure that we, we make properties um, a little bit more resilient or resistant to flooding. Uh, I'm just checking now to see if there are any other questions. Um, and I can't at the moment see any, so that's a, a, you know, quite surprising for this time of morning, but I'm guessing it's, it's one of those things where introducing a subject perhaps hasn't raised too many issues. Um, so at that point, I'm going to, if we haven't got any further questions, I'll hand back to Katie to sum up. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your expertise this morning. I see some good feedback coming in already. Um, just a, a very quick opportunity, if you have got any further questions, just pop them over to us now, or ultimately you can get in touch after the webinar. Um, our next webinar Wednesday session is on the 22nd of March, and that's uh, where we'll be looking at fire risk assessment. So if you want to join us, pop onto our website, cbld.com slash webinars, and you can register to attend there. Again, we're always looking for feedback, for comments, for any sort of suggested topics that you want us to cover. We can certainly uh, look into those for you. So if there's anything there you want to get in touch with us about, then please do. But other than that, can't see any more questions. So uh, thank you very much for your time this morning, and uh, we'll see you next time.